Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing study of the year 1968. In the last few lectures, we've started to turn our attention to the international events of 1968, and particularly the important role that students played in those international protests. We started in the last few lectures by looking at the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia and events in Poland. In these lectures, we'll turn to some of the most pivotal events of the entire year, those in particular in France that occurred in the spring and early summer of 1968. The movement in France originated at Nanterre University on the northwest outskirts of Paris. That university had opened in 1964. It was built in an area between industrial development and some urban slums. The buildings were unattractive. It became a breeding ground of discontent. There had already been protests about petty campus regulations, the nature of teaching, and the content of some of the courses. Certain departments in particular were rife with discord. In January of 1968, university authorities called in plainclothes police to spy on students and photograph the most militant of them. The students turned the tables, spying on the spies and posting photographs of them around the campus. The administration called in riot police to break up the protests. The tension boiled over on March 22nd when five students were arrested for participating in an anti-Vietnam protest. In response, students stormed the administration building in the middle of the night and occupied campus offices. The students were evicted the next day, but that night the students bonded. The exhilaration and excitement of the activity infused them, and the student movement in France was born. From then on, it was referred to as the March 22nd movement. Protest in France really escalated in May, culminating with one of the signature events of 1968, the so-called Night of the Barricades on May 10th through 11th. The episode is rooted in history, as protesters had thrown up barricades in those same streets in 1848 and 1871, and various other forms of protest had gripped the streets in 1917, 1919, during World War II, and again as recently as the early 1960s during the colonial struggle over Algeria. The causes of the 1968 protests were rooted essentially in a society that had grown static and inflexible. The frigid hierarchical social order of post-war France, and particularly the cold, elitist contempt of President Charles de Gaulle, who had been a World War I hero and had led the Free French Resistance during World War II. But now he alienated the working people and the students. The government had become heavy-handed. Television and radio were heavily controlled, and there were few women in influential positions. All they needed was a spark. The episode began in early May with the announcement that the United States and Vietnam were meeting in Paris for peace talks. The announcement inspired many students and protesters to come out of the woodwork. At the same time, the campus at Nanterre University, where the March 22nd movement began, was the scene of continued protest. Officials had actually closed the university the previous week, but students reclaimed the campus for themselves. Students in Paris needed little extra reason for protest. They were living in impossibly crowded conditions and attending classes on outdated campuses. The number of college students had doubled since World War II, but most facilities were unchanged. The students had the time and the freedom to consider protest as an option. On May 3rd, the Nanterre students appealed to their fellow students at the Sorbonne, the University of Paris, for support. About 500 students attended a rally at the Sorbonne. Others stood outside jeering the protesters and waiting for opportunities to strike. At 4.45 in the afternoon, university officials called the police and they arrived in riot gear. Dozens of students were arrested and driven away in vans. 
Some students were already beginning to turn over cars in the street to block access for the riot police. The police fired tear gas grenades into the crowd, and the students scattered. Let me read a bit of a poem describing this event by Angelo Quattrochi. Barrages of black-clad flicks, leather and steel and plastic, forgotten nightmares, masks of blindness, lines of fear, sweet and sickening taste in the mouth, dry palate, bowels, the first wave. The black-clad army is now a wave of black-clad men, inflicting pain with white clubs. To be left alone is to be grabbed and clubbed. It is falling down and being kicked by many converging on the prey. A girl lies unconscious. Grenades make bangs and blue clouds, cobblestones, stones found near the streets. Nauseating gases impregnate streets and lungs. Protection, regrouping, embryos of barricades, then barricades. Captured students are taken to Notre Dame de Champ police station. At 10, it starts to rain. At 11, the flicks are masters, the Sorbonne ringed in black. In response to these attacks, the students called for a huge demonstration on May the 6th. That day, over 30,000 demonstrators assembled in Paris, and thousands more gathered in cities all over the country. The protest was directed against the security police and police brutality. From the government, President de Gaulle sat in his presidential palace, arrogant and unconcerned. There was no hint of compromise or negotiation. Every day, the demonstrations grew larger. Each day, clashes with the police grew more intense. The students were now growing accustomed to breathing tear gas. May 10th became the so-called Night of the Barricades, one of the most important moments of 1968. That morning, news came from the government that they would withdraw the security police and reopen the Sorbonne. But the students refused unless all student prisoners were released. A huge crowd gathered in one of the central squares in Paris. After discussion and negotiation, they decided to occupy a district called the Latin Quarter, which is somewhat similar to the French Quarter in New Orleans, an older part of town. There were thousands of armed police in all directions. One student recalled, The enormous demonstration is halted in Boulevard Saint-Michel by gigantic forces. We are encircled. The decision is taken to occupy the Latin Quarter peacefully, not to provoke the police, but to defend ourselves if attacked. The huge crowd spread throughout the maze of streets, piling up co cobblestones ripped from the roads, traffic signs, scaffolding, and other rubble. The atmosphere was exhilarating and exciting. Some 30,000 protesters participated. As one student, whose name was Daniel Cohn Bendit, who was one of the leaders at Nanterre University, recalled, It's a moment I shall never forget. Suddenly, spontaneously, barricades were being thrown up in the streets. People were piling up the cobblestones because they wanted, many for the first time, to throw themselves into a collective, spontaneous activity. People were releasing all their repressed feelings, expressing them in a festive spirit. Thousands felt the need to communicate with each other, to love one another. That night has made me forever optimistic about history. Having lived through it, I can't ever say it will never happen. Students piled the rubble in heaps as high as ten feet tall. They overturned cars and buses in the streets. Inhabitants of nearby houses offered assistance, providing food and water, sugar and cloth to help the students overcome the gases the police would throw. Late that night, the reports came that heavy numbers of police were on the move. The crackdown had begun. For his part, President de Gaulle never seriously considered other options. It was simple. This was insurrection. Force must be used. He met with his advisors to discuss the issue, but no one tried to convince him not to authorize force. And so the crackdown began. 
The massed ranks of security police wore thick goggles, helmets, and black leather. They launched tear gas and mace over the barricades, as well as small explosive grenades. The students in many cases were overcome by the gas. Students defended the barricades as best they could, holding out in some cases for an hour, in other cases much longer. The gases forced students to flee from the streets, seeking refuge in apartments nearby. Sometimes people let them in. In most cases, civilians stayed locked inside. Here are excerpts from one student who was there. Then the police attack at three points simultaneously. Casualties are heavy on our side, mostly people knocked unconscious by gas, some temporarily blinded, some make Molotov cocktails. I try to dissuade them for fear of police massacre. Not so much of us, but of thousands of onlookers just standing there fascinated. We feel liberated. Suddenly we have turned into human beings and we are shouting, We exist! We are here! A well-known French football commentator was sent to the Latin Quarter to cover the night's events. He reports the following. Now the CRS, the riot police, are charging. They're storming the barricade. Oh my God, there's a battle raging. The students are counterattacking. You can hear the noise. The CRS are retreating. Now they're regrouping, ready to charge again. The inhabitants are throwing things from their windows at the CRS. Oh, the police are retaliating, shooting grenades into the windows of the apartments. The producer interrupts the broadcast. This can't be true. The CRS don't do things like that. I'm telling you what I'm seeing. And then his voice goes dead. They have cut him off. Eventually, the police overcome the protesters. Thousands were arrested that night. Some students found aid from passersby. Cars and taxis smuggled some of them out of the area. In a final desperate act, some of the student leaders run through the area calling for a general strike by the people to protest the police action. In the following lecture, we'll pick up the story with the events of the next day and beyond in France. <laughs>